Welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine. That's me. I'm going to start standing up again because I want to show <laughs> this finished-ish control room. Um, I only say ish because there's a couple, couple little details. It's really finished in the way that is important to me in that um, it really, like the, the acoustics are really done. I covered up everything try and make it look nice some of you may have seen my instagram post but here's here's another look at where things ended up so obviously here's the back of the room um you know i got this cool couch in here and i'm really excited about this because um it's all storage so like yeah so there's all my like youtube -y stuff in there i can have my you know, some tools and stuff in there. I, I really needed it in this place. I mean, I only had two little drawers, rack drawers over here. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a little bit of an issue. So uh, love the couch. Every single one of these sections is storage. And then I got little tables and, you know, uh, drawers in them and stuff. Um, and then here is the, the front of the room again. And so you can see all the screens. I keep, um, the upper screen i keep my desktop just black so i don't have an image blasting me in the face uh when i'm working on stuff and sometimes it's, it's even hard to tell <laughs> if the screens are on but those screens are on uh the upper ones um you know like if i move something up there you would definitely definitely see it here yeah there we go and right now all th all three of these screens via this matrix right here are showing the same thing, which is just additional desktop space for my main computer. Um, and ultimately, probably the big screen in the middle there would be additional desktop space, and the upper two would be cameras, so I can see people out in the sound room. Um, but, you know, there it is. And, and this time now, uh, unlike the uh, Instagram post, I put the EQ rack back in its little sort of cubby there. Um, so it's really like just this beautiful open space. And uh, it was interesting with the cubby when I measured it. So here's my little measurement microphone, my earthworks, you know, I put it right here in the listening position right there. Um, it really didn't measure differently having this rack out in this position. I like to pull it out there when I'm tracking uh, mostly because I'll EQ a bunch of stuff going through, going into the tape machine. Even though it didn't really measure differently, when I put it back in there, when you listen to it, you can tell it was definitely messing with the stereo image a little bit. So once I get to the mix stage, you know, most of the stuff has been printed through an, a, the analog tape machine. I've used those EQs already. And so when I'm doing my final mi mixing or mastering, I tuck that thing away. Really, it's quite easy. It only takes a couple minutes. You know, I pull these couple tubes out. The thing just pulls right out. You know, I can put it back in there. The, the little, the, you can see the umbilical cord, I left space so I can actually pull that slack and so it doesn't get sort of, you know, bound up in the back there uh, and prevent you from pushing in so you can, you know, pull the slack and just pull the thing in and out. It's, it's, it's super easy, so uh, I think worthwhile. And uh, so, so there it is, you know, it's, it's done. I'm really ready to move on now. And uh, we'll get into all the acoustic stuff, the last you know, final tweaks of the acoustics in a second here. Uh, but there is one aesthetic thing that, you know, I originally planned on having, just using the same fabric all around the room. And there's one thought that I had, you know, there's a slightly darker fabric for the tubes on the floor up front here that, that mar matches closer to the carpet. And so maybe that sort of ties it in somehow. I don't know, you know, aesthetics are not really my thing. Um, I'm doing my best to try and <laughs> have this look good. I mean, if it was really left up to me entirely. I probably would have just left it the way it was. I, I can't leave the uh, fiberglass uncovered. But, um, but okay, so here's, here's last thing. And you all can actually be involved in this decision if you want. You can weigh in on this because it wouldn't be that hard to do. It'd probably take less, ha less, less than half a day to, to make the change. So here, I'm going to put, put this on a stand. And then I'm going to go over and I'll show you what I'm thinking here. Okay. 
Uh, let's see if we can see. Yeah, we can see everything there. Okay, so I kind of feel like these panels, which are covering up, you know, the remaining gaps that would reveal all of the goofy looking tubes that are all, you know, buried behind the screens here. There's still all the same tubes uh, that were, that you used to be able to see in the front of the room are still back there. Um, but you just can't see them. It's all obscured by the screens and, and these fabric covered, you know, frames. And it feels to me like so much of this stuff at the front of the room, like the speakers are this beautiful dark gray and the screens are kind of dark that this light beige, it, this, I think the color is called sand, um, is too contrasty with the screens. And so I ordered a swatch of this fabric. It's the same fabric, just a different color of it. And I feel like this could look cooler at the front here, you know, next to the screens. And so, and I would probably frame this whole this whole thing with it. I don't know if you can see that. And so this tube right here would get covered and all of these flat panels would get covered. So the whole front of the room would be this dark gray thing instead of this more contrasty looking thing where, you know, there's dark screens and dark speakers, you know, um, sort of contrasted against the the light beige in the front so that's that's the option and um again like uh, you know i <laughs> i just i don't really care that much about how things look i i had the thought but i'll leave it to you all you know if you think it'll be better to have the whole front of the room and be that sort of darker gray and and feature this i, I guess the maybe the speaker it'd be easier to focus on what you're looking at on the screens, maybe, I don't know, you know, seems like it makes sense to me. So if you think that might be better, I'll, I'll switch it. If, if you all like the beige stuff better, I'm gonna leave it. So there you go, this is, <laughs> you, get, you get to choose this one. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna put the camera on the stand over here and then I can get into all the rest of this. Okay, so before we get into all of the technical stuff uh, that happened, I'm excited to share that. There's some really cool things that happened right in the end here. Um, just a quick update on what's been happening in our world here. It's uh, been um, a lot of joy, uh, just a, a joyful time with the completion of this control room and some of the other stuff that's been going on. Even, you know, despite the fact right now, uh, Mama's out on the road. She's she's touring, just out there, just killing it um, on tour. Uh, I don't know if any any of you might happen to be uh, a fan of Grace's stuff. Um, this is a great time uh, to see her live. Her her band and crew is like super dialed in. Maybe the most dialed I've seen it since I've been in her world. And uh, and she is doing this crazy like guerrilla theater thing with her shows. I don't want to give away too much, but it's really worth checking out, man. It's it's totally incredible. So, I mean, even beyond, you know, she's an amazing performer, but um, what, she, what she's doing is really like next level. So, um, super excited for her. It It's hard for us when we're not together, you know, we when the family's not together, it's always kind of tough, but Sega and I are here holding down the fort, making the best of it. And um, so uh, it's been pretty fun lately. Uh, so um, one thing that happened recently, um, you know, we've never, Sagan can go in whatever direction his passions lead him. You know, we obviously, Grace and I do music, but he can do music, he can not do music. We've never really like, you know, pushed him in that direction. This stuff is around, it's available. If he's interested in it, he can grab it and play an instrument or whatever, or sing, you know, whatever he wants to do, it's fine. If he doesn't want to do any music stuff, that's totally fine too, whatever makes him happy. Um, but it finally happened recently after there was a recent round where we were all together on tour and he just, you know, he's getting a, more aware as he gets older, he's, he's six now. And, um, and so got a little taste of like being around the stage and the performing and stuff. And after we came back, 
we were home and uh, for the first time ever he's like dad i want to play in a band <laughs> like all right sure let's let's give it a shot you know and so uh so i i set up some stuff so we could play in a band like right now he's really enjoying scooby-doo and so <laughs> we had our first little like um band jam moment playing some scooby-doo theme music so it was just kind of incredible uh so here i'll share a little bit of that with you <laughs> so you got sagan on drums obviously me holding on for dear life trying to play through this song and then our just amazing wonderful um au pair <laughs> who's from italy she has this beautiful italian accent singing scooby-doo so um so so that happened that was pretty incredible um and then uh, so then he, he's still been interested in this. So when we've had play dates with some of his friends, uh, the stuff has been set up. I, I moved it from the living room. It was a little much having it right in our living room. So I moved it to the basement. And so he had another friend, uh, come over and it was just the two of them jamming. So this, this is what I'm really getting into, uh, is just like they express interest, hand them an instrument with no like instruction or guidance at all just f just do whatever you feel just find your own way you know and the results are really incredible it's it's like the shags man it's just i couldn't be more excited about this so this is him and one of his buddies and this is like this is probably the first time sagan has ever actually held a guitar in his hands and and just banged on it and it's just hilarious <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's like I don't know if any of you are familiar with the shags um, but this is what it reminds me of and that's really what that experiment was you know there's a family, the father wanted to have the kids play music, got them instruments, no lessons, no instruction. And uh, if, you've met, if you've never checked out the Shags, you kinda, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, there's a song on there called My Pal Foot Foot that is just, <laughs> it is just sheer genius. You know, it's really the most amazing example of when you let human beings just do totally free expression on instruments. Uh, it's it's great. Uh, so then there's another one. That just happened. Um, uh, just happened today. Or earlier today, uh, we had <laughs> two more friends come over and jam session ens ensues. You know. One, two, three, four, go. <laughs> Nobody wanted to sing. It was pretty funny. But actually, earlier before that, when I set the mic up, they were all all over the microphone. And then once we started playing, they got they got shy about it. But uh, but that and that one, um, you know, uh, we actually introduced a distortion pedal. Sagan enjoyed that quite a bit, and uh, it's all open tuning, make it easy so he can just swing at that thing and you know go for it. Uh, and so that was pretty awesome. We also just, you know, recently, it's just been the most beautiful, picturesque, just light, gentle, fluffy snow coming down for the last two days. And so we've got this amazing snow and it's staying cold. So it stays really, it's that really light, airy, sort of dry snow that you get. And so it's been amazing sledding and it's just beautiful, just like a winter wonderland out there. It's just been a good time. Whoa, watch out, Max. Woo! And they're down. Wipe out. Oh, man. Yame took a hard right. 
<laughs> so yeah, so there's Sagan, one of his buddies, and uh, and again our lovely au pair Yabe um, sledding. So it's been it's been really incredible, and we've also uh, at this point um, moved into the barn. So I'm staying in the barn uh, with Sagan, and and I think. Um, I, I kind of had to do it at this point. That really wasn't the original plan. I was, you know, we were going to have a, a house that was separate from this. But, um, you know, I think it's the it's the only chance I have to actually get everything done that needs to be done at this point. Between, you know, actually finishing this place. You know, the la this last week I was up like sealing countertops, and after Sagan goes to bed, right now I'm, I'm recording this. Sagan is asleep upstairs, and I couldn't do that. When we were in the house, I can't, you know, even though the house is close, I still I'd go outside, walk all the way over here. If he woke up in the middle of the night, which is not uncommon, um, and I'm not in the house, I mean, I, he would be traumatized for the rest of his life. So, um, so here I actually have a, a little monitor on. So as soon as I hear him, Dad, you know, I'll have to stop and run up there. Um, but it's going to allow me to actually be in this space more. This is just my favorite place in the whole universe to be right now. Uh, I, there's just no getting around it. I just love being in the building. I love being in this room so much right now. And just even looking, I can see the screen and seeing this behind me instead of that just unbelievable shit show of tubes and stuff. I know there's some people that were sort of lamenting the loss of the mad scientist look, but I, I'm I'm ready to let that go at this point. I'm so much happier to see see that behind me. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it's just great to be in this space. It just feels incredible. So um, it's really it's really been a, a great time. And uh, and you know, there are times along the way. In general, I am just nothing but grateful for. Um, you know the 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 light, where I've landed in life at this point, um, but there's certainly challenges. There are times that are crazy busy and deadlines and super challenging, or things aren't going the way you want them, or whatever, and all that stuff. And there's times like this where it's just incredible, just effortless joy, and it's I think it's good to go. This is great. This is a great time. So that's what it's been. Okay, so um on to all of the technical stuff so um while i was away in california um i was you know it gave me time away from this whole thing to just kind of reflect on it and think about it more and i think there was a lot of comments from people and questions you know people asking ultimately like um did you really if you if you could have gone back and done it all again, would you have just skipped the VPR panels and just done tubes? You know, obviously there's so many tubes in this place, and and you know it really turned out to be a very essential part of this. I don't think I could have gotten this done without the tubes, and it really did raise a totally reasonable question, a fair question of like, did I did it really make sense to do the VPR panels? So. Um, you know, this process has been an opportunity for me to really try and answer questions like that along the way. Um, you know, I'm not real. I don't have, there is stuff going on, but you know, I, I can take that time if I choose to. I'm definitely really eager to start making some music at this point, but, um, if I choose to, I can, I can answer that question. So I wanted to, I wanted to try and answer that. So that's what I did. When, the first thing I did when I came back is while I was in California, about a week or so before, I ordered materials, I got things ready. And so when I got back, I wanted to just spend a day. It would only take one day to try, try the experiment and see what would happen. And so this is what I did. Um, first, the back wall. I took, pulled all the tubes away from the wall, so this is before all of this finishing stuff happened, pulled them all away from the wall, pulled all of the VPR panels off and put them out in, in the hallway over here and then put the tubes back in place and I wanted to see if there was really going to be a significant difference. Um, do I really need those VPR panels um, on the back wall? And so here is the result. Uh, so I took a new sort of base reading when, when I got back. So um, this, is, this is where I left off uh, with the whole thing. Um, and so, you know, 
eh, I guess we can show the whole thing. So, um, so when I left off in 2023, this was October of 2023, this is what the graph looked like with no EQ. And this is what I was able to get it to do with EQ. And so I took another reading after I got back from California. And it's very similar. It's roughly the same. You can see, you know, it didn't change in any really significant way. Doing all the same stuff. And then here it is with the EQ again. But, you know, I got this thing here, this 200 hertz thing. And I was having to do a pretty aggressive amount of EQ here. And I just, it was, it was causing me to not totally be able to sleep at night. <laughs> and so I, I, I needed to, I don't know. I just, it's a sickness. So, okay. So, so there's that as well. I wanted to see if I could address that. Um, so this is what happened. I got a new base reading. So here it is with no EQ. I, on, uh, with all of these experiment stuff, I, I like to do it without the EQ on there. Okay, so then here we are with tubes and VPR panels on the back wall. Now this is with just the tubes and no VPR panels. And you can see it's not a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> probably not a difference that matters, you know? And so there's a little, you know, it's a little spikier with the peaks and valleys right in here. And then I realized that uh, I played with the positioning of the tube. So once um, the VPR panels got taken off the back wall, it gave me the opportunity to push the tubes more flush against the back wall. And so that's this. And so that actually diminished some of this peakiness a little bit. And so you end up here and it's like, that's not a meaningful difference at that point. I mean, there's a little bit of something here I'm gaining, I don't know, a little bit of low end here, but really it's, it was not consequential. So I removed the VPR panels from this back wall. They're now in the hallway and I'm going to use them in the small sound room. It's the other side of the wall in front of me. Because um, I'm going to have to acoustically treat that room at some point. I got them. They weren't doing anything back here. So instead of having to buy more crap to treat that space, I'm going to use that stuff in there. Great. It's not like I'm going to throw it away or it's wasted, whatever. Um, the only thing that was wasted maybe time, but I don't know. Did the experiment. It was interesting. Okay, so then the other experiment that I wanted to do is let's just see if the tubes are just better, you know, and the whole VPR thing was just a total fool's errand. And so I took these panels, they're now covered with the frames with fabric on them. So before these covers went on, they were, the, you know, just the VPR panels hanging on the wall as you had probably seen them for a long time. I pulled all of those off and I managed to talk the, the company that I've been buying um, these tubes from, uh, this place called Homans, um, right here in Williston in Vermont. Um, I managed to convince them like, hey, can I come and buy a bunch of these crazy fiberglass tubes and try them in my place? They'll be totally unaltered. I won't peel the, you know, I won't adhere them together, anything. They'll be exactly as they are. And if they don't work, can I bring them back? Because this is an experiment. I don't know if I'm actually going to need them. And they sort of hemmed and hawed a little bit. And then we figured out a way to do it where they felt comfortable with it. And then, so they let me do it. And so I, I don't know what it was. It was like, you know, 20 tubes. Because there was, you can, you can go stack them three high, a nine foot thing. So I did, you know, six over here. Yeah, so that's three times six is 18 over here. And then I believe it was seven over here. So another 21 over there. So, you know, it's just shy of 43 foot tubes that are all 12 inch diameter in the room. So I took the VPR, VPR panels off, put 40 tubes, three foot tubes back there and tried to measure the difference. And so here you go. So it would be 
this right here. So this is all tubes on the back wall versus the VPR panels. And so not really a difference there. And I think a part of this is that all of the important stuff that happens happens from basically the listening position forward in the room. And so that's why the front of this room has basically become anechoic because I have the ceiling, the walls, the front wall, and now the floor, <laughs> a good portion of the floor, covered with absorptive material to try and make it essentially anechoic. Uh, and so it wasn't a huge difference there. And the tubes were a little bulkier. They took up a little more space in the room. I do, you know, the VPR panels are a, a cleaner look for that. Um, the tubes in the back were a big difference. Uh, if you go back through the video, you can see when I added those, that mattered. And so between the two, I know I needed the tubes back there. They're also larger diameter, you know, they're, I think, a 20 inch, 20 inch exterior di diameter. Um, but that really made a difference. And so I know I, I need to keep them back there. Um, but on the sides, I could choose either and it didn't really make much of a difference. I stuck with the VPRs there. So, and then I even did one where I had nothing on the back walls. And I have some pictures of this that you can see. So, so here's the back wall and I put this piece of tape down to show where the tubes were um, when the VPR panels were on there. And then this is after that and I was able to push them a little further back. And so I just marked the line where they were originally so I could compare that. Okay, so then here is, here is the back of the room with all of the VPR panels pulled off before I put all tubes back there. And so then uh, the graph that I just pulled up is this one right here. So this graph is what it sounded like when the, the back of the room was like this. So tubes no VPR panels behind them, nothing on the walls. It looked like this. And that's compared to this, which is, you know, this is with the VPR panels. And then this is with all tubes um, on the side walls back there. And so really not a significant difference back there. I mean, if the walls, even though the, you know, the frequency response curve in my listening position um, doesn't really get affected a lot by that, uh, by those differences. When you're sitting back there, if those walls were bare, you'd hear this horrible flutter, you know, between those walls. It would sound bizarre back there. So it definitely needs absorption on the walls uh, back there, even though it doesn't affect what I'm hearing that much. It does affect what you hear back there. That's important as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I do care a little bit about what people hear back there. So, um, so yeah, so it's important to put something up there. Uh, I'm sticking with the VPRs back there. Okay, so then I still, I still got this thing. Um, and so probably this is the best example of it right here. And so I had made some progress with this before. Uh, this is before I, I put um, tubes on the floor in front of me. And so you can see I have this thing going on here and even a more severe version of this 200 hertz thing going on. And so I added some tubes to the front and the ceiling and stuff and I got it to here. And it was, I, it was better, I think it was better than this, but still, I still got this thing, you know? And and it was a little, a little too much EQ. So I got to the point, you know, I was really hoping that I'd do more tubes and maybe that would solve it. And, you know, um, I want to put more stuff up. Um, I'd, I'd add more tubes to the ceiling and that didn't quite do it. So here, here I am with these, you know, cancellations in the front of the room and sort of a last ditch attempt. So I had put seven tubes on the floor in front of me and there was some there's some gaps in there and there's there was like three smaller ones 12 inch ones and then four larger like 16 inch ones and so 
Because I had a bunch of extra tubes here when I did the experiment in the back of the room, I had a bunch more 12 inches around um, that I could try. And so I was like, ah, fuck it, let me just throw a couple more of those up front. And so this is with seven tubes in the front. This is with nine tubes in the front. Wow! I finally found it. <laughs> the, the thing that was totally fucking with my 200 hertz, man. Oh, it finally, you know, revealed itself. And so, uh, so here it is. This is a comparison of what happened. This was just two tubes. And I think it may be because now it's a very continuous um, absorption across that floor between me and the speakers, you know. There's a big reflection off that floor right in line with the speakers. Um, and so... This was the point. When I got this and I was able to listen to it, at this point, like, this is with no EQ on these speakers. And that's close enough. I could learn how to mix on these speakers with no EQ on them. And that was really what I was hoping to get to with this room. I didn't want to, like, have these amazing, beautiful sounding speakers I have to do all this crazy shit to them to try EQ and cockamamie stuff to try and make them sound good. Maybe a little tiny bit. And at this point, like the stuff that I would do is just is more things to just voice these speakers, which are really designed to be very, very flat. Um, but I actually don't want to hear speakers that are perfectly flat. I want to hear speakers that have extra low end. This extra low end was really a courtesy of the design of the room. So like the, the length of the room and having the speakers pushed all the way up against the wall gives you this, this boost in the low end. I need that. That's what I like to hear in the room. It feels more satisfying. I won't put too much low end in when I'm mixing. It's just what I'm used to. So I need that. And just a small move here around 50 hertz to kind of fill in that void a little bit. But again, like I could totally learn how to mix around that. You know, I wouldn't have to EQ that. And this now is like, just on average, it's just a few dB below where all the sort of main mid-range stuff is, which is what I really sort of use as the defining frequency range of what the volume is. That's what your ears are most sensitive to, is this sort of like 1K to 5K range, you know, right in here. So I'm really trying to match everything to this range. And this stuff on average is probably a few dB down. Um, and again, probably I would be fine. The speakers actually sound pretty wonderful without any EQing at all. And that's what I, that was really what I was hoping to achieve, uh, is have a version of this where it could totally work. And so I finally felt like I got there. Oh my god, it was, I've been working on this control room for a fucking year. A year I've been dicking around with this thing. Okay, so, um, so then I was like, woohoo, okay, finally, I can, I can sleep at night. Um, let's make this place not look like a pile of shit. <laughs> okay, I've been looking at these bear tubes and probably breathing this goddamn fiberglass long enough. I don't know who knows how many years I shaved off my life um, building this control room. So there we go. Um, I did, I covered everything, did this, put up the panels. I added the TVs and I tested that along the way to make sure that those upper TV monitors wouldn't do some crazy thing. They didn't. Um, and so that was, I felt comfortable with that. I uh, was able to commit to that, really get those mounted properly. And, um, and so uh, did the veneers, put everything up. Okay, and then got, this is one of those moments where you put all this work, I mean, this is days of work. This, uh, this was a lot of work. Uh, yeah, I, at least a full week, you know, of sewing and putting things on and rehanging everything on the ceilings, you know, because I'd done quick temporary things where you can see the wires that everything's hanging from. It looked all looked like a nightmare um and so like you know it just took time to get it to, to try and look nice you know and so uh week and a half probably of solid just working on this room trying to make it look nice and i got this 
And so it was a little lift different. <laughs> I was like, uh oh, oh fuck, uh, something changed, you know? I was really, really excited about that. That's just a little bit better than this, you know? All of a sudden I got this weird mid range thing here. And it turned out that um, if you go back and look, uh, I had put these veneer panels, wood veneer panels, on these two big tubes that are just left and right of the speakers. And it turned out, you know, I was hoping that that curved surface would create enough diffusion that it wouldn't cause any weird, you know, phasing and weird anomalies with frequency response, but it did. Um, and, you know, conceptually, the benefit of having something reflective on, you know, on each side of the speakers is it can give the impression of a wider image. It can, it can widen the image a little bit. Um, and that part of it was pretty cool because I got to hear it that way for a bit when I first put this thing together and it did sound pretty wonderful in that way. And probably um, if I had room for it and I did like a QRC style diffuser, you know, the thing that looks like it's a bunch of wood blocks that are at different heights and it's based on prime numbers and it's extremely efficient um, diffusion. And if you use you know, the right size blocks, and it really it would be the, the depth, the overall depth of this thing that would determine how low of a frequency. If I had the right depth to go all the way down to 1K, which really doesn't have to be that deep, but even with that, these tubes are sort of already starting to crowd the, the speakers a little bit. I can't squeeze those panels in there, but that would probably work, you know. If I could push it back a little bit, um, and put those types of diffuser panels there, it probably would work. And maybe that's an experiment to do down the road. I'm fucking over it right now and I, can't, I cannot work on this room anymore. Um, but I could probably swap those tubes out with something slightly smaller. Maybe it won't make a huge difference and add QRC style um, diffusers and that, that might be really beautiful sounding for widening the image. But for now, I gotta leave those panels off because when I pulled those panels off, it did that. And so now I'm back to that place again. Um, and there was even, even some other things. I sort of optimized the positions a little bit. So when you compare do, 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 this one with this was my big sort of revelatory one, I actually kind of gained a little bit here. It's a little flatter in this low mid area. Um, it's, I gained a little bit of low frequency energy here. So overall, after everything got covered, um, I think I even em ended up in a slightly better place that would require maybe even a tiny bit, you know, half dB, maybe dB less of EQing. And so this is now where I'm at with everything covered in its final position. I'm super, super done <laughs> with screwing around with this. And just, just for reference, you got to see where I came from with this, okay? And again, just I got to just point out, ignore the upper upper part of this because on this first reading, I wasn't being careful about where I placed the microphone. I was only looking at the low end, so just ignore the top part. I'm going to go all the way back to before there was any tubes at all in this room. Not a single tube trap in the room, but I had VPR panels on five all five surfaces, front wall, back wall, side walls, and ceiling, VPR as much as I could fit in the space. And that looked like this. That is just not a usable, you know, listening environment. And so that's why I went on this crazy ass journey. And this is the thing that's so fucking incredible about these goddamn tubes is that it went from this crazy, total disastrous low end thing. Like there's no way I could mix with that. And with no EQ at all on these speakers, literally just the output of my monitor mixer to a power amp to the speakers, the only difference between what you're seeing right here and this 
right here is tube traps. That's the, that's the only thing that happened between those two. I'll put them both on top of each other. That's a, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. It got me all the way there. And so, you know, the tubes are they're crazy and it looks bonkers in here and, you know, it's kind of a ridiculous thing and I'm a crazy person and all that shit. Um, I'll take all of that, you know. It's all good. I know I'm a crazy person. But they turned my fucking speakers into this. And, and that's what matters to me. And these speakers sound fucking amazing in here. <laughs> it's incredible. I've been in a lot of control rooms. And it's kind of, this is kind of a good time to sort of just address the whole journey that led me to where I am. Because there, there's definitely choices here that, you know, are unconventional for sure. And, and I think they make more sense when you understand where I've come from uh, on this whole thing. Um, and there's a lot of people that are asking the question, and it's a totally fair question to ask. Why didn't you hire an acoustician? Or, you know, there's people that are saying, hey, why did you take the approach that you did, this rectangular room, you know, uh, you had all the space that you could have worked with, you could have done whatever you want, you know. And I think it's, uh, these are totally fair questions. Um, and so I kind of want to start with, my experience with control rooms over the, you know, 30 years that I've spent recording stuff in a bunch of different rooms, some of the best studios on the planet I've been in. And it's been really interesting that getting main monitors in a room to really sound great is not easy. It's really not easy because I've been in a bunch of studios where there is, I mean, unlimited resources, unlimited access to the best acousticians, best equipment, best everything. And you go in there and even they will go, yeah, you know, the mains aren't really that great, <laughs> you know? And you got to wonder why at a certain point, why does it end up there? And it's been like that in so many places, you know? And it happened to me when I first moved into Barefoot. You know, I had somebody design a room for me who was an amazing architect, who I still work with, and built, built tons of control rooms and, like, sound mixing stages for film and tons of amazing places. And built me this incredibly intricate room with no parallel walls and all of that shit that, by the book, is supposed to be incredible. And that fucking room sucked. It was, sounded terrible. It was a disaster. The low, it had a cancellation right around 80 hertz where that fucking frequency vanished and it made the low E on a bass guitar just, it had absolutely no punch to it at all. It was terrible. And, I, you know, by no fault of the person that I was working with, they were following all the conventions. But the conventions don't always fucking get you there. And I hired acousticians to come into that room. They'd come in and put on fucking records and listen and tell me, oh, you have to put bracing on the back wall, you know? <laughs> put it on there, no fucking difference. Oh, you have to put plywood on the floor in front of the console. No fucking difference. That room still sounded like shit. And so I've had a lot of experiences where it's like, all the stuff that you're supposed to do and all this convention, and all these experts and all this fucking bullshit didn't do anything to get me to a place where I had speakers that I could fucking mix on. And I've been in so many studios that have the same thing. Even recently, I was in a studio where it was like, you know, um, I'm not going to name names here because I don't want to, you know, say disparaging things, but one of the premier studios in the world. It's been there forever, you know, for a long time, incredible history, countless numbers of amazing records have been done there. Um, in that room, they currently have, you know, um, large monitors made by, you can guess it, there's only a few companies out there right now that are making these types of big, huge main monitors. It's one of those. And th they themselves, the company that makes the speaker, like this studio is so 
prestigious and important and the person that works there is such a big deal, they come there themselves and tune the speakers and get them all dialed in and make them all super duper 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 whatever. Those speakers are unlistenable. <laughs> I just, you know, like I don't fucking get it. Go in there and you can tell like everybody that works in there, they, when they, you really have to make decisions, they use near field monitors because those big ones are just a joke. You can't make any informed decisions on those speakers at all. There's no way. They're just this phasey disaster, you know, roller coaster ride of fucking low frequency, you know, insanity. It's a disaster. And there's, you know, that's a bunch of experts, super no know, people knowing what they're doing kind of shit, you know? And lots of resources, all the money, super expensive speakers, all that. And they're, I, I promise you, they're a disaster. Okay. This one, I will name names because I'm sure everything has changed now. It has no bearing what's going on now. But um, this is Skywalker Ranch. Go into that studio. Talk about unlimited resources. We're talking about Star Wars bucks in that place, right? George Lucas, no shortage of funds there. That facility is unbelievable. It's the most incredible sound room. I recorded a good portion of that first Third Eye Blind record there. Specifically went there for this amazing sound room. So... Uh, just, you know, so you get an idea of the spare no expense approach at this place. Uh, they hired Alan Sides from Ocean Way. If you, don't, if you haven't heard of him, he hasn't really been in the forefront recently. But like in the 80s and 90s, he was the guy um, for studio technology and speaker stuff and whatever. He had um, put together these custom speakers at Ocean Way Studios that everybody was like, oh, these things sound amazing. I heard those speakers. I mixed the T-Ride record on those speakers, Studio A, Ocean Way, and they did sound incredible in there. They really, they just worked in that room. It all came together and it worked. And he had this system for doing it. And so then he started installing them in other studios. Other people were like, oh, I wish we could have main monitors like this. So there he did it at, um, at Skywalker Ranch. He himself came. He brought all these custom components and it was based on these old like Altec Voice of the Theater drivers and all this stuff and these passive EQs and power amps and this big thing. I'm sure insanely expensive. And put the whole thing in there. Those speakers did not sound good. <laughs> they were also messed up. And the same excuses, you know, from the people there. Oh, yeah, you know, he has to come back and tune them again. They're just not quite right. Something happened. Uh, they're, you know, whatever, right? Excuse, excuse, excuse. Speakers don't sound right. So, happened there. I mixed a record at another of uh, the premier, you know, studios in Los Angeles. Tons of amazing records have been done there. Um, this, this particular studio, I, I spent a, a little over a week trying to mix a record there. It was the All-American Rejects record. I had to give up. I left. Um, and, you know, main monitors in that room, unlistenable. Terrible. And it, I remember towards the end, you know, of my patience with that place, uh, Jimmy Iovine was involved with that project. He came in to, to listen and he went, yeah, I never liked these speakers. This room doesn't sound very good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Another, another great premiere studio. Everybody thinks it's awesome, whatever. I'm sure tons of great records have been made there. Nobody likes the way those speakers sound. And so, you know, I've just become, I'm trying to think if there's any other examples that I can, I can think of, of rooms that are supposed to be amazing that just sound disastrous. But it's, it's extremely common. I, I, you know, I just have to say, like, I don't know that I've really walked into a studio and sat down at the monitors. I, I guess really the only time that happened for me was that Ocean Way Studio A. That was kind of an anomaly. And uh, it was, that was an amazing experience because, uh, you know, this was circa 1990. I went in that room and they had this demo reel of Alan Side's recordings that they would play on the speakers that he mixed them on in that room. And, and that room was the place where his design really worked. I mean, he did it for the first time in that room. It worked, and then he tried to do it a bunch of other places. It didn't work in the other places. And so, um, and so I went in there, and you listen to this reel of his mixes, and he made some amazing recordings. Everything from, like, the soundtrack to the movie The Omen to, like, this Olivia Newton-John recordings, like, all kinds of stuff. It sounded 
unbelievable in that room. Incredible. So it, it was possible to do, but that was one time, you know, in all of my travels doing this, in all of these places where they, could, they really could do anything they want. Unlimited resources, access to all the experts and all the best equipment and all the whatever you want, and still it sounds just, you know, it doesn't work. And so after all of those experiences, I've become extremely wary of the conventions because they really haven't gotten there so many times. And there's just so many excuses about it. And I'm like, I, I'm not, you know, I just want these to sound good. And I'm going to have to figure it out for myself. That that's really was the conclusion I came up with. And I would say I did figure it out for myself. It's fucking crazy for sure with all these crazy tubes and all this crap. But like that graph right there, that's proof that this shit worked, you know? And, you know, so like there was a question, there was a comment about like, hey, you could have done anything you want in this room. Why didn't you do, you know, um, non-parallel surfaces? I already said why I didn't specifically make that choose. I, I had a room with non-parallel -par surfaces. That is not the answer by itself, for sure. That room, to get it right, I had to fill that room with tubes too, you know? And so if I'm going to fill the room with fucking tubes, then I don't want to go through the hassle of making all these weird angles in it, you know? Because um, I, I ended up in the same boat in that room. You know, no parallel angles. I could probably find a, you know, a drawing of that, of that space. But it was, you know, when you look at it, it was very carefully done. No parallel surfaces anywhere in that room. That's not the answer. And so, <clears throat> so with this room and then this time around, I did have, you know, I was really banking on the, getting a better result from the VPR panels. I was really, really hoping that that was going to be the solution. And I wouldn't have to go through all this tube madness, you know. What I was told at the outset of this is that these VPR panels, if they're done right, open window down to 60 hertz. I'm sure you heard me say that if you've been watching all these things. That's what I was told. And if that's really true, then I wouldn't have been seeing this problem here and this problem here. You know, 60 hertz. It's down here. I, I shouldn't be having these issues. Granted, you know, I wasn't able to cover every single square inch with the VPR panels. Maybe that's the difference. Maybe that's what you have to do. And, you know, those six inch gaps between them might be the difference. Um, and why I'm still getting, getting this with the VPR panels. But, you know, so conceptually at the outset of this, my hope was that I can just have a regular rectangular room. It is all golden ratio stuff. That's supposed to help. Maybe it did. I don't know. Um, and with VPRs and everything, I, sh I thought I was not going to end up here and not have to go down to craziness. But I did. So, and I want my room to sound awesome. And so, I did that. I did the tubes. So, I, I totally get it. You know, the, the very, very reasonable and fair comments to make um, about the insane, you know, um, process that I've, you know, undertaken on this. Uh, but it has got me here. And, um, and I, I, you know, I couldn't be happier. I think there was one comment that feeling like the, the room is maybe sort of a, an odd listening environment. And, and I promise you, it is not that. Um, it really, really sounds extraordinary in here. And I've heard a lot of rooms, and maybe I'm more picky about this than other people, but, you know, I, I really want to, I don't want to screw around with near-field monitors. I want to hear all of the information all the time on a pair of speakers that I just know and trust and just use those speakers. Um, and that was my goal in this room, and I've, I've really got there. I'm just going to mix on these speakers. Maybe I'll check on headphones occasionally, but when I'm listening to speakers, I'm only listening to these because it's all there. You know, this all goes way down you know, whatever this is, this right here is 20 hertz, 20 hertz right there, maybe only a couple dB, few dB below sort of the average level of the speaker. So these things are pretty much flat all the way down to 20 hertz. 
and you know they go up as high as I can hear them for sure. And uh, and so you know I've really I, I've really got there uh, with these things um, as 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 sane as it was. Um, and so then actually I should probably show the final thing. So here it is with just a tiny bit of EQ. And over time, once I actually spend more time actually mixing on these, I might fuss with this a little bit, this mid-range move. So this is now a very broad lift. And as you can see, it's only a couple of dB. It's a very, very small move. And, you know, I think uh, I'm going to leave this a little bit low in the low mid-range. You know, I sort of grew up in the era of 80s and 90s of record making when people were really pulling out a lot of low mids and stuff. And, um, uh, and so I think it's good for me in particular to have the speakers a little bit low in that range. Um, so I'm not pulling too much of it out. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to work with this for a little bit. You know, it's just a tiny little tweak away if I, if I find that I need to massage things a little bit. And then again here, very small move. This is, you know, probably one, two, three, maybe a three dB boost down at 50 hertz. This is two dB, very broad. This is a Q of probably less than one. So very broad. This is a little bit tighter in order to, you know, focus more on that 50 hertz thing. Um, and, you know, so I'm done. <laughs> I'm done for now. So, um, so there, there it is. So, okay, enough of me spazzing out about all of that. Um, let me show you how all of this happened, because I got a bunch of documentation of all this, and I think that might be interesting for you all if you want to see some of this. So uh, the fabric that I'm using on all of this stuff, it goes both on the tubes and on the fabric covered frames that are covering up the VPR panels. Um, I got from um, you know, online source. It's called Acoustamac. Here is the website. This is the specific fabric. They make, th they have three different types available. This is the type that's stretchy. So it's really, really great to work with for the tubes because you just make a sock that's a little bit smaller than the tube. And, um, and so once you create the sock, you just slip it over there. It holds itself on there and then you have to figure out a way to button up the ends. So this is the fabric. I used this color here. That's what you see on all the walls. And then I'm going to try this color, depending on what you all say, I might put this color in the front of the room. Um, so that's the fabric. And uh, I have some videos here I can show you on how all of this is done. Here's, um, here's a time lapse of building one of the frames and stretching fabric and mounting the frame, doing all that stuff. We'll do the you know, the, the fabric co covered frames uh, for the VPR panels, we'll, we'll do that first. So check this out. Uh, there's no audio in the video, so I'm going to sort of talk over it as it goes. Um, so this is a wonderful gentleman, uh, local Vermonter, that's um, uh, helping me with all of this uh, for this phase of things. He got pulled in on some of the construction stuff. And uh, so... He was available to help with this. These are this is one of those processes where having two people makes it go more than twice as fast. And uh, but it's really straightforward. I had to make seven of these frames, and so I cut pieces and built the first one just to make sure it all fit and everything was going to work right. Um, and then did it assembly line style. That is always the fastest way to go. So once I confirmed that the the, the design was good, then I did all of the cuts and I just used stock. Um, you know, uh, finished grade pine uh, from Home Depot. It's one by two. Um, so I don't have to rip anything down. It's, and so all I have to do is just cut the lengths that I need and uh, design, the, design the frame um, with CAD software. Unfortunately, I, the CAD software I use doesn't work on an M1 processor. I can't pull that up here, but um, it's very straightforward. It's a very simple design. And, um, and so then, you know, uh, cut everything and then just did it assembly line style. So built the, the sides up first. Once I had all the sides, then we could actually put, put the things and form them into the rectangular box that they are. And so then now this is us stretching the fabric um, over it. 
So you cut a piece of fabric that has enough slack so you can get it over the edge. Um, I'm doing the, uh, the staples on the inside so there's no staples on the surface that needs to actually mount to the wall or mount to the frame that mounts to the wall. And we found, you know, I start by doing one side really even because there's no tension yet. And then as you do each side, you pull the, the, the center even from, from both sides, then you do the ends, and then you just keep splitting each section in half to get a nice, nice even pull. And then once the thing is really, you have enough staples in there um, to have it all even across it, then um, you can go down the line and staple everything and really lock it in. But yeah, put, you know, starting in the center and then the ends and then having it, you know, as you sort of pull the tension seem to be the best for just keeping it straight on there. Um, so then you have to figure out how to finish up the ends. Um, with these particular panels, you'll, you'll never be able to see the, the bottom and the top, they're obscured. You know, the top is so close to the, to the ceiling that you can't really see those, and the bottom is sort of out of, the line of, out of line of sight, so you can't see those. So you, we put like a little fold on there, and then on the bottom, I, you know, the staples are actually exposed there. And then I can cut away this fabric and make it so it's a, a nice continuous flat surface because we got to put this frame on here, and this helps um, straighten the original frame um, because you're using the one and a half inch dimension along this long span, which is a little stiffer than what the, uh, the other frame, which is turned vertically, so it's not quite as strong. When you stretch the fabric, it, it would cause it to bow a little bit. So this straightens that out. And then it gives you, right here, there's a little quarter inch, uh, three quarter inch reveal that allows you to have something to nail through so you can nail it to the wall. And so, once we got these things on there and everything got straightened out, there it is. That's what it looks like. Take it into the room. And then here we are put, putting it up. It's super easy. So, you know, uh, the thing's not that heavy. One person can kind of hold it in place. And so once we got it held in place, I would step back, make sure it's relatively even. And once, once it's lined up right, just take um, the nail gun and go over and just lock it in. And there we go. Bam, VPR panel in place. Okay, so that's, you know, um, that's good overview how those were done. Um, and so then uh, let's get into the tubes. So um, the tubes are this process, you sew the sock, you stretch over the thing, you button up the ends. So <clears throat> here's sort of the beginning of the process. You have to cut this fabric. So here's a video of me. This one I'm actually talking in the video so you can um, explaining what's going on, so you can check that out. All right, so a little bit about the fabric stuff. So this is my setup for creating, you know, sewing these big, it's essentially like a big sock. And um, so I'm making some that are for the 12 inch diameter tubes. And it works out with the fabric. The, the fabric comes in these bolts that's 65 inches across. And so if you cut it exactly down the middle, which is what I've just done here, just cut it down the middle, it gives you two pieces that are about, you know, 32 and a half inches. Um, and then when that gets sewed into um, a cylinder, it's a circumference of, it ends up being about maybe 31 and a half inches. And it stretches over a tube that has you know, a diameter of 12, and that circumference ends up being about 37, 38 inches. And so the fabric, you know, stretches enough that um, it'll fit. It'll fit over. It's a nice snug fit. It's maybe a little tight, but if you do it this way, then there's no waste. You know, so I'm not having to cut off a big chunk on the side or something. I get to use the entire width of all of this fabric. Um, it makes a big difference in uh, how much you're having to buy and throw away. So. Uh, so yeah, so this is the first part, cutting it down the middle, and then I'll, um, I'll fold each of these over and put pins in to hold the seam together, and then just go right through the sewing machine. So 
that's basically it, pretty easy. So now uh, I have a time lapse of me sewing one of these big long socks. I think this one was like 11 feet long. It was a piece of fabric that I had, um, you know, one big chunk. And uh, it was, it ended up being more efficient. Instead of trying to cut each one to perfect length, I'd sew these big long lengths. And then you'll see in a little bit how you put it over there and just, you know, you're able to, once it's on the tube, then you can cut it off wherever you need to and uh, again sort of minimize the waste but here is um, here is my sewing uh, I've, this is a time lapse and the, the camera was slowly sort of drooping I apologize for that but you, you'll get the idea so here I am uh, putting all the pins in you know this process is is pretty tedious uh, it, it takes a little while to make these things and um, so that you know I have to lock in the, the seams on there and so then you just sew down the line and in this case um, you know I, I'm having to sew very very close to the edge it's about anywhere from a quarter inch to a half inch from the edge and then here is uh, uh, my buddy came to help just feed the fabric through because it was such a long piece um, and so so there it was and so now here is putting the fabric on and so on the 12 inch tubes it slips on fine so again this is like a whole 11 foot piece so you have to put the whole thing on there and um, and then pull all of the extra slack and then you can cut off the slack and this particular tube is one of the ones that's now down on the floor in front of me and so only one end of it is visible so uh, so I only really need to dress the end that's visible and the other end I can just have some extra slack tuck it inside the cylinder and just pin it in there so it doesn't come flopping out and you'll see a nice clean edge from you know when you're sitting on this side of them and you won't be able to see inside the tube and I'm really into only doing as much as I need to to create the illusion of a finished look <laughs> you know I if I can't see the other side I'm not gonna spend my time making it look pretty because I'll never see it and I don't care so um, so this I'm pinning that stuff in on the side that you won't be able to see and then in a second here you'll be able to see the little pucker that we came up with for the finished side I think I show this yeah what what we did is we bunched it up on the inside and so on the inside of here is just like all the fabric bundled together with a wire around it to hold it in place and so you get that finished look and then I don't have to come up with you know cut out a wood disc and you know staple fabric over it and glue it on there which was just going to be time consuming and a pain in the ass and these tubes were working well without being capped off and at this point, because I really knew that I had gotten the results that I wanted, I didn't want to change anything. And so this makes it so um, the, you know, the fabric is mostly transparent and will let the low frequencies go through. And so in theory, they would perform the same as they did when they had no fabric on them. And that, that turned out to be the case. And so this ended up being a good solution. So here's putting fabric over one of the large tubes. So this is one of the, the large tubes that are just to the left and right of the speakers, the ones that had the wood veneer panels on them that I had to take off because they were causing that mid-range bump. And so, uh, so there you go. Yeah, you just kind of have to work the fabric down. And, um, you know, this, this piece was cut to length. This was a tube that this tube was made way back yeah this tube is probably almost 20 years old now <laughs> you can believe that well, is it that old no uh yeah 15 years old now because um, this was one of the tubes that i built to fix the barefoot control room and uh it was a nice big diameter and so i ended up bringing it with me to vermont i was able to bring not every single one i ended up selling off some of the tubes because um, i couldn't fit them all uh, but I brought a bunch of them. So that tube is 15 years old. It fixed barefoot and it's fixing stuff here. So, and so this one did have a wood cap on the top 
And so, uh, so this gentleman is, you know, stapling the top. By the way, this this guy that's helping me, he has I, probably the best given name I've ever heard. His name is actually Dragon, which is just incredible. It doesn't get much better than that. I think uh, it's a Croatian name. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's been super, super awesome, helpful, very fun to work with. It's been great having him involved. So, yeah, so he's stapling uh, the top here. And because uh, there's... A, a wood disc on the top to staple to, and in in, in that case, um, you can't see the top because again it's so close to the ceiling you'll never see it from you know uh, the perspective that you're looking from. All right, so this is what we came up with for finishing these tubes. Um, you know. The version that I'm doing is not capped at the ends and didn't make a huge difference one way or the other. And so I figured, you know, I don't want to have to put a bunch of caps on these things. Um, so if it's, if it's not going to make a difference, I don't want to do it. Uh, so, but I still got to try and figure out how to finish this. And so some of the tubes, um, the ends aren't really visible. And so you'll see like this edge, but you won't actually be able to see down into the tube. So in that case, I just put some, you know, had some extra fa uh, fabric and tucked it inside and just used some regular uh, sewing pins to just kind of pin it in there so it wouldn't come flopping out. And, uh, and then you get, you know, like a nice clean edge, you'll see that and um, you're good to go. But these, you will see the end. And so I had to come up with something for that. And this is this is what we did. So it's kind of like a, a Tootsie Roll. And so uh, what you do is, this, this is like uh, this whole section. This was a 50 foot section of fabric that was all sewed to this size, this 12 inch outer diameter size. Uh, there's probably the, definitely the most of these in the room. And so we would just do long stretches of it and you can slip it over there and cut it off, you know, at the length that you need instead of trying to like measure each section exactly right. And there's only ends up being just a tiny little bit of waste from each one. It's just, you know, a couple inches. Um, so, so this is, this is what we got here. All right. The Tootsie Roll. Make sure you get all the slack out of there and just bunch it all up in the middle. So once, once I know what's going to work here, cut off the amount that I need in order to, to finish this. And so for this, I use a much um, lighter gauge wire. So this teeny little stuff, it doesn't really need to be that strong because these things you know, they're, they're not very, very heavy. It's probably I'm maybe five pounds, something like that. So you get a section of this wire and then I put a little fender washer on here like this. Just loop it through the hole a couple times, something like that. Okay. And so then you end up with something that looks like that. I already did the one on the other side. Um, I'm having it come out just, just offset from the uh the seam where it was sewed because if you try and go right through the seam there the, the fabric is kind of doubled up there and it can it can get hung up trying to get through so i just push this thing through from the inside just kind of wiggle it so it'll break its way through the fabric okay there it is boom And that, that holds it up fine. And so now I go back, I bundle this up again. Now that I know I've got the, you know, the amount of material that I need to do it. So I'll gather this up and get a nice tight bunch on there. Here's my wire. This is, I, I believe, 18 gauge steel wire. So, you know, it's, it's super stiff. It'll bend. It holds its form really well. Let's go, go around a few times. Okay, and then I'm just gonna cut off the uh, excess wire. 
Got her here. Nice, you know, uh, strong wire cutters that can handle something like that. All right, so there's that. And then the last thing, you just trim off the excess of this. So I leave about maybe three quarters of an inch just to make sure it doesn't slip out of the, the little wire that binds it up there. And looks like that, pretty sweet. You got your wires coming out, you can hang it from, so there won't be anything looped underneath it. And it looks like it's just sort of suspended up there magically somehow. Um, still got to trim this one off. Let's do this one. Okay, there it is. That is a totally done Tootsie Roll tube trap. There you go. All right, so we're doing the fabric on the Hemholtz things and uh, figuring out how to hang them. And so what we've done is I put a little bit of super glue on the fabric so you could then drill through it. Because this, you know, the, the, the soft ones, you can just poke the wire straight through. You don't have to drill a hole or anything. Put a washer on the other side and then it's suspended from that. And then I don't have to like wrap the wire around the outside of it. It'll just be hidden up top. And so there's some over here where that's actually happening. So these ones, you know, look pretty much like they're just hanging up there and you can't really see the, the wire that's on top of it that's holding it. And so this one, we had to drill the hole and then here's the little fender washer on there. Keeps it from pulling back out. And, uh, and so then, yeah, just hang it from that wire. That's how we're doing it. Okay, so now we can get into the veneers. Um, and so uh, I didn't get video in while we were doing it, but when I pulled the ones off of the, the, the big tubes in the front, I had them out and available. So I made a quick video just talking through how that happened. So here is that stuff, information about the veneers. I wanted to show a little bit of detail about how these veneers were done, these, these curved veneers. Um, I saw some people asking about it already. Uh, uh, I didn't get video, video along the way, but I can sort of explain how it all came together. So this is, this is a finished one here. And actually, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the direction. This is a finished one here, and um, you can see, you know, here's the little nails that I put in there, you know, to um, get it so it'll just hang on the on the face of the tube. And so there's a little finishing nail hiding up there. You just push it in so it pokes into the fiberglass and it'll keep it from sliding down. And then if you look at the back of this, you can see on the inside, it's just this hard, like cardboard material that they use as um, a form for making a, a concrete pillar. You know, so this is, this is what that stuff looks like. Um, you know, this is a large one. It's like 18 inches in diameter, I think, something like, yeah, 18 inches. <clears throat> and then here is the actual veneer stuff. This is a piece that was a scrap that was sort of left over. Um, so this is just birch, and it's super, super thin veneer. And this stuff is done with, you know, an adhesive on the back. So you just peel off the backing, and then you can just stick it on there on the front of it. Um, and then this, I did like a uh, linseed oil rub on there. I'm using this tried and true stuff. I think it's some sort of Scandinavian version of it that's that's really like pure linseed. Um, you know, so that's the difference in the color. It brings out the grain more and gives it the, almost sort of like iridescent quality. It's pretty pretty wonderful. And uh, and so <clears throat> you know, so once you have the the size that you want, then you would you know cut a piece of the veneer that matches. And the one thing, the only thing that was a little bit tricky, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You get, the, get a piece that matches the same size, pull off the backing, make sure you have it straight. You stick it on here. But then the one thing that was kind of tricky was to really get these edges to adhere properly. And so what we did is we took 
an additional piece of this same tube, and once the veneer was on the exterior surface, sink it down in there. So it's getting pressure all the way around. And then the most important part is these outer edges, because if it's gonna peel off, it'll start here. And so what we did is we took two pieces of wood on either side of this and clamped them on, on each side. So we had probably one, two, three, four, you know, maybe five clamps on each side with this wood that, you know, distributes the pressure evenly all the way across this edge to make sure the whole edge is really like getting squeezed together. And the adhesive really needs pressure to get it to really adhere to this surface. And you don't have to leave it for a long time. You know, it's not like a glue that needs to dry and cure. It just needs pressure in order for it to really um, stick to that surface. And so, uh, so we would clamp it and leave it for maybe only five minutes, pull the clamp off, and then it's really, it's really holding on really tight here. You know, it's, it's really not, not going to just pop off. So hopefully, yeah, I don't know, maybe over a long time it might, but so far they seem really solid. So that was the process for building these things. So there you go. That's how those came together. Here, I'll pull up um, the, the veneer that, that I used. Um, so uh, the, the vendor that I bought it from is called Wisewood Veneer. And the, the specific one that I used was this white birch wood veneer, rotary cut, spliced, um, of course, uh, the cheapest one. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, as expensive as this was, um, you know, it could have been way more expensive. I'm always trying to find the cheapest way to do things. Uh, so this is this is what I used, and it has an adhesive backing like you saw, and it's super easy to work with. It worked really, really great um, for this. Uh, so if any of you are interested in going down this road, that's that's the stuff I used. So there you have it. That was my my journey uh, with this control room. Um, I I couldn't be happier in two ways. I couldn't be happier that it's over. <laughs> this was such a long road uh, to get here. And I couldn't be happier with the results. Um, I'm really, really excited uh, to actually start using this place and, um, you know, really get the benefit of what all this, sh you know, has to offer. And also at some point, you know, get some other people in this room to experience it because it is pretty incredible. Um, I've had some people come and just, just listen to music, just have them come in here. Just pull up your favorite whatever, you know, favorite sounding record, favorite song, favorite anything. And, you know, it's kind of jaw dropping when people come in here. I had somebody come in, it's not even, you know, doesn't work in the studio or anything, just pulled up some stuff that their favorite stuff and they literally were like emotional, I'm starting to tear up, you know, listening to stuff in here. It's incredible. Uh, so, um, I couldn't, couldn't be more excited about it. Um, finally, just, I think I can finally sleep at night. So, um, thank you for enduring this un <laughs> exhaustive journey. And, you know, hopefully there's something useful in there. Uh, maybe save people some, some time, you know, if you want to go after this. I mean, I think the thing that I like the most about the tubes is that it really is pretty dummy proof. Uh, you know, if you put enough of these in your space, it's just going to get you there. And, um, you know, it's a lot. It's kind of crazy and it looks kind of bizarre or whatever, all of that stuff. But, you know, if you want to just make it happen, it will make it happen. And I think, like I, I mentioned earlier, this place has ended up essentially anechoic in the front half of the room. Um, you know, all, all of these surfaces are now just like... Uh, in the front of the room, it's still like a layer of VPR and a layer of tubes in front of it. So it's a lot of absorption. And, um, you know, it works. It'll get you there. You're basically removing the walls from this space. You're decoupling the listening environment from the walls. And it worked for me. I couldn't be happier. If anybody else is crazy enough to try it, I'm sure it'll work for you too. All right. Thanks for joining me on the jury. I'll see you on the next one. All right, bye-bye.